Welcome to our first webinar for the Sustainable Spotted Wing Drosophila Management Project. This is a USDA NEFA specialty crop research funded project involving collaborators from a number of different institutions shown here on this slide. My name is Hannah Burak and I am the project PI based at North Carolina State University. But as you can see, we have cooperators from a number of different institutions all listed here. Our presenters for today include myself, Dr. Hannah Burak, headquartered at NC State University, Lauren Diefenbrock, also at NC State, Ash Sayal, who's based at University of Georgia, Philip Fanning at Michigan State University, and Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State. For the remainder of the slides, you're going to see a little icon with one of our photos in it. That'll indicate who is speaking to you at any time. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar series is the product of part of our Sustainable Spotted Wing Drosophila Management Project. This is a large project, including a number of collaborators from many different institutions with the goal of integrating spotted wing drosophila management practices with those that we already use to manage other pests. Ultimately, reducing our reliance on insecticides is the sole means of managing spotted wing drosophila and then to deliver this information to you, our stakeholders, and to facilitate your ability to apply that in your production systems. As you, are, as you know today, when you signed up for this webinar, the topic today, however, is optimizing our insecticide tools for managing spotted wing drosophila. We're going to focus on three main topics here. First, selecting effective materials to manage SWD. Next, using those materials in programs that are designed to reduce detectable pesticide residues with a focus on blackberries and blueberries. And then third, we'll talk about tactics to improve efficacy of pesticides in the cropping systems that are affected by spotted wing. For those of you who don't deal with this pest on a daily basis, I do want to familiarize you a little bit with some of the basic biology before we start rolling. As their name suggests, male spotted wing drosophila have spots on the end of their wings, while females lack those spots. Females are the sex that damage fruit. They lay their eggs just under the surface of fruit. The larvae hatch internally and feed, developing through three different stages. They then pupate on, near, or inside fruit. This whole process takes 10 to 15 days, depending on the weather, and adults can live for a month or longer, so we have multiple overlapping generations per year. This is one of the difficult challenges in managing spotted wing drosophila. And spotted wing drosophila is new to us. It's an invasive species. It was found in California in late 2008, detected throughout the West Coast in 2009, and into Florida in the fall of 2009. After that, it spread through the southeastern United States, the Midwest, and up into eastern Canada. It's now been detected essentially throughout every state in the U.S. Prior to its detection in the United States, spotted wing drosophila was relatively uncommon as a pest. It was studied in Japan at the turn of the 19th century. It was detected in Hawaii in the 1980s. But in those areas, it really flew under the radar screen in terms of damage. This global range expansion was similar in Europe to what we observed in the United States. So in the same period of time, from 2008 through 2013, spotted wing drosophila spread to a number of different European countries. It's now been detected in South America, in Brazil, Chile, and Argentina. So everywhere that grows, the things that spotted wing drosophila likes to eat is now dealing with this pest. In this webinar, we are going to be focusing on four main host crops. Um, and these are the host crops that have been most significantly affected by spotted wing drosophila. We're gonna focus on blueberries, valued at over eight and a half million dollars a year annually. And based on surveys that we've conducted with blueberry growers, average crop loss due to spotted wing drosophila has been reported at 13% in that crop. 
Blackberry is valued at at least $38 million on an annual basis, have experienced a higher rate of crop loss than blueberries, so averaging 27% crop loss in some of our grower surveys. Raspberry is valued at over $580 million on an annual basis, averaging an even higher rate of loss, up to 41%. And then cherry is valued at nearly $850 million for fresh and processed fruit, experiencing a reported 9% crop loss. And so these crop loss statistics were based on grower surveys that we conducted that are summarized at the web link on the bottom of your screen. We're gonna be asking you who are growers to help us expand our knowledge base on where we are seeing damage from spotted wing drosophila at the end of this webinar. So we'll have a link for you to share some of your experience dealing with damage due to this pest. The biggest challenge in managing spotted wing drosophila is that there is zero tolerance for infestation in fresh fruit for all of those host crops. And right now, the tools in our toolbox, insecticides remain necessary in order to meet this extremely low threshold. And that, therefore, is why we are focusing on insecticides and optimizing their use for spotted wing drosophila control in this first webinar of our project series. I'm now gonna turn it over to our second presenter, Rufus Isaacs, who's at Michigan State University. Rufus is going to talk to us about insecticide efficacy and performance in different crops. Okay, everyone. Thanks, Hannah, for the introduction. That was, that was a great start. And yeah, as you can see on the slides here today, my plan is to review some of the work that's already been done. There's a number of people that have been studying the insecticides that are effective against spotted wing drosophila and how those perform in the different crops. We don't have time to review all of that today, but I'm going to show you um, some summaries of, of what's been learned as a context for then more detail that um, others will present on, on the recent research that we've been doing as part of this project. So this is a, a nice image that was uh, made a few years ago by the Boston Globe, and they, um, they put together a summary of, of some of what's known about the life cycle that relates to chemical control. As you can see over here, this big uh, stop sign that's indicated on the adult fly, particularly the female fly, is the focus of the insecticide control that's been um, that growers have been implementing. This is to stop the female fly from laying eggs. And obviously, if, if you can kill the fly before she's ready to lay eggs, then that reduces the, the uh, pressure from this pest. We also, though, I think have learned a little bit more about how some of the effective insecticides not only protect the fruit from, um, from this pest by killing the flies, but they are also um, killing the eggs that might be laid just underneath the surface, those that there's a hole that the female cuts with her ovipositor, with her egg laying device. And those eggs that are just under the surface, if we have some of, many of the effective insecticides will also um, prevent that egg from surviving, which then reduces the larval, um, the larval pressure. <clears throat> of course, if if both of those stages are controlled, then we get fewer of these larger larvae. And this is where a lot of the concern is, having large enough larvae that um, people can see those and, and see that fruit might be contaminated. So really, I think that the goal, and we'll talk about this during the webinar today, um, the goal is to try and minimize the detection of those larger larvae that, that might be seen. If those larvae survive, then they pupate in that next stage and then we get the, the life cycle continuing and more flies. And as the table shows at the top there, they can develop quite quickly at summer temperatures in our region. It can be just a little bit over a week um, when we're seeing another generation and that can build up very quickly during the season. So chemical control is, a, is an approach to try and minimize these life cycles developing and of course, limiting infestation in the, in the fruit. One thing that we've done to summarize a lot of the efficacy data that's been developed over the years is to ask our colleagues around the country, this is specifically to the United States, to ask them how they perceive the different insecticide options working for um, control of spotted wing drosophila. And so this is not as scientific maybe as some of the data that you'll see later in the, in the presentation, but it gives you a sense of the relative activity 
as perceived by these um, researchers and, and industry experts from the many states that are listed at the top. We asked them to rank these different pesticides in terms of whether they had weak, fair, good, or excellent activity. And just going across the graph, you can see that there's a number that we would not be recommending for spider ring drosophila control. But just looking at the ones above good that we would consider to be effective, um, you see a number of pyrethroid class insecticides. So that's Asana, Bifenture, Brigade, Danitol. Those are all pyrethroids. And for those of you that are on the webinar from uh, other countries, um, unfortunately the trade names may be different there, but this is the US um, trade name. We then have um, Delegate, which is a spinosin, um, Diazinon, that's an organophosphate, Indigo is a mix, uh, a premix of insecticides. In Trust, I wanted to highlight because that's uh, spinosid, that's one of the most effective insecticides that has a registration for use in organic production. So that shows some of the challenge of organic producers that even their most effective insecticide is still only considered good. Uh, a number of others there. The XRL is a new chemical class. This is a diamide, and so it's nice to have another chemical class to rotate for resistance management. Fifanon is a, is a formulation similar to malathion, but it's, it's formulated for aerial application. Hero is a pyrethroid, which is a mix of two active ingredients. And then we've got imidan, a, another organophosphate. And then lanate, which is the only carbamate that we have on this list that we rank as being uh, particularly good for spotted wing drosophila. Malathion is listed there, and a number of people use malathion, although it doesn't have really long residual activity, but it's uh, on the list there. And then the last really effective one there is Mustang Max, and a lot of growers have been using this pyrethroid for control of spotted wing drosophila uh, in the crops where it's registered, of course. And then Radiant is a formulation of the same material that's in Delegate, but just for strawberry production in the US. Finally, on the right, Warrior is registered for use in cherries and has been used by cherry growers for SWD control. So you'll be getting a copy of the PDF of these slides if you registered for this. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the other slides in as much detail as that, but it does show you um, some relative activity. And you can look at these in some more detail um, later. What I did want to do was switch to the next slide, which provides um, the kind of information that we're able to give our fruit growers here in, in the US. This one was developed for blueberry growers, and it provides a lot of the summaries of all the different details you start to really need to pay attention to when you're spraying for spotted wing drosophila. Not just the rate, but the seasonal limits and the days between sprays that are limits as well. So this is maybe another reference material that you can look back to. Um, the way this has been organized in the following slides too, is that we have them divided up by chemical class. So if you look down that second column, you'll see organophosphate, pyrethroids, carbamates, diamides. And that just is a tool to help you think about rotating chemical classes. So picking something from a different, um, different grouping in, that row, in those rows would help you keep um, resistance from developing. And then finally, I wanted to highlight the last column there that says rank. This is um, relating back to that previous slide. This is fair, good, or excellent ranking. And you can kind of look at that again and compare across compounds for what is, um, what is most active. So this is for blueberry for the United States. Definitely uh, advise you to check locally and, and talk to your local extension staff to see what's registered and, and what people have experience with in your region. But we've done this for blueberry. We also have a slide that's very similar for cane berries. There's a few fewer options for cane berries and some different restrictions. So depending on the crop, you definitely want to look at the, the specific information for your specific crop that you're growing. And then finally, we have a table in here for cherries also. And um, depending on the crop, you can look at the results of what we think the efficacy would be for those different crops. So to move on, uh, I've just got a few more slides where I wanted to give an overview of the, of the kind of information that we see when we test insecticides. I, I, I would echo what Hannah said earlier, that this is one of the main tools that people are using for spotted wing drosophila control. And these results are from blueberry fields in Michigan, where 
Uh, we compared the amount of infestation in unmanaged fields where there was no chemical applications versus those in managed fields where they were getting either a conventional or an organic um, pest control program. And you can see the activity of this pest starts up in July in our region here in the, in the Great Lakes region of the United States. As we get towards the end of August, for the, or into August for the fields that we were sampling, uh, most of these fields stopped harvest, or the commercial fields anyway, stopped harvest um, in the early part of August. And you can see that the pest pressure built up right after that. But on those red lines, we were able to keep, um, keep control with seven day interval pesticide applications um, through the vast majority of the harvest period in organic or conventional settings. Um, but you can see that if you don't control this pest, the numbers will rise rather quickly in, in the later part of July and in, into August. So I think the final slide I have is to, um, is to just sort of put this together into what some of our growers have been looking at for spray programs. And, you know, taking those individual rankings is, is, is a good starting point, but at some point, and I think it's good to do it before your growing season starts, is to think about how you would build a spray program that would, would obviously be legal, would um, provide good activity, and would also rotate the chemical classes. So this is an example where if you look down the columns from the, the long number of weeks that you might be harvesting a blueberry field, uh, for different crops you may not need this many weeks of control, but it gives you an example of how to go from chemical class to chemical class and to rotate through the season for resistance management. I saw in the questions there's a um, there's, um, question about application after rain and we have shown in, in research here in Michigan and elsewhere in the, uh, in the US that reapplication after rain is really important because the rainfall does wash off the chemical residues and so that's another thing to prepare for in advance. Try and think about what short pre-harvest interval insecticides you might use if you're three days from harvest, four days, five days, and the rain washes off all the, the residue that was there. So I wanted to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Lauren Diefenbrock from North Carolina State University will um, present the next slides and um, thanks for your attention. I'm going to talk to you all about some research we've done in North Carolina on programs designed to reduce residues um, in blueberry and in blackberry. We're going to address what insects, insecticide residues are associated with typical management programs and what insecticides are associated with lower observed residues. So, as I said, we did this research in North Carolina. So we tested several rotational insecticide programs for the management of spotted drosophila in blueberry. Um, and here's an overview of management programs that we tested in this system. We have two export programs that are designed to meet the goals of exporting to various countries that we are, that we commonly trade with. A short pre-harvest interval program, which allows growers to get in and have their pickers pick within uh, the next day. Reduced risk treatment program, and this contains two materials that are known to have less effects on um, beneficial insects. And in blueberries, we were also able to include an untreated control, which unfortunately, when we get to blackberries, that was not an option. All right, so for the next few slides, I'm gonna show you a series of graphs for each treatment combination, um, so you can see what the insecticide residue levels look like over time. The active ingredient and trade name for insecticides will be on the top of each graph. The amount of residue in parts per million will be on the y-axis. The downward pointing arrows indicate when an insecticide application was made. If applicable, a line showing the maximum residue limit or MRL for the US, European Union, or Japan will also be present. The MRL line will vary depending on country um, for export. There are various limits depending on where you want to export your fruit to. These are important because residues over the limits will prevent export and sale to these countries. So for our first, this is our first export treatment. In this, we used a combination of imidan, melathion, delegate, and danitol. Um, and as you can see, I'm going to pop up a screen that gives you the quick trends. So you don't have to spend forever looking at these slides. An imidan 
Shortly after spraying, there's a quick decrease, but we had a persistent residue, which is detectable until the end of our sampling season. However, if you'll notice, that is not above the maximum residue limit for any of the countries where we want to sell to. For malathion, we had a quick peak in residue after application, which decreases in two weeks. And if you look across the bottom line, you will notice there is a dashed red line, and this is the limit for the European Union. Um, this cannot be detected on any fruit to be sold in the European Union. On the bottom left, we go to delegate. This similar malathion had a peak of residue post application, but it decreased in about two to three weeks, and it was all underneath the maximum residue limit. And Danitol is our final application in this program. And we had a peak of residue post application. It's a very persistent material, so it's going to be detected for quite a while post application. Um, just like malathion, it was cannot be used on something that's been sent to the European Union. All right, moving into our second export treatment, we had a combination of lanate, malathion, delegate, and Danitol. And for lanate, uh, you can see going underneath my box, it's a very, very persistent detectable material. We're still within the limits for selling within Japan and in the United States, um, but this cannot be used on material from fruit to be sold to the European Union. Um, malathion and delegate, just like we saw previously, they have residue peaks shortly after application, and those decrease in two weeks. And then at Danitol, we also saw a quick increase in residue shortly after application. Our short pre-harvest interval program included Malathion and Mustang Max. Um, Malathion, just like we saw previously, is detectable, has a peak of residue detection shortly after application, which decreases very quickly within two weeks um, to being very minimal. And Mustang Max, um, you can see on the graph underneath the orange box that with each successive application, we actually see a slight increase in the amount of detectable material uh, with, with each application. So you should note that Mustang Max, um, there's no limit right now for selling it to Canada. So if that's your primary export, you don't want to use material on that fruit. All right, and our final um, treatment for blueberry was our reduced risk treatment. And this had a rotation of XRL. Um, and delegate. For XRL, detectable residue decreases quickly but remains persistent throughout. Um, and delegate, we saw the same pattern. You get a peak after you spray it and then it decreases within two weeks. All of these, or both of these materials, sorry, are within the MRL for all of our trade partners. So a question we get quite a bit is how long these residues persist in blueberry. A zero level is considered pretty, pretty good, pretty ideal. You can sell it anywhere. Um, but as you can see, not all the materials reach the undetectable points in the time frame of our study. Of these materials, phosphonate and methanol are very persistent, being detected even one month after application. Uh, phosphonate oil persistent does seem to break down quickly and remain present in very low amounts. Uh, if you're going to use this information from the two slides we just presented to create a management program, it would be wise to go by the largest time interval after application and the highest detected residue and try and make a treatment plan that is appropriate to your market needs. So we also did a similar study in Blackberry in North Carolina, and you'll notice that we had far fewer materials included here. There are less materials that we could use in this system. There's also no um, untreated control, and that is because if we did not untreated control in our system, we would not have any berries that we could use. So similar to the slides you just saw, um, we have the material on the top of the, each graph, the detectable residue in parts per million along the y-axis, and arrows indicated where we sprayed along with the residue levels. So similar to what we saw before in blueberry, the malathion and the delegate, they peak in the residue detection about uh, shortly after application, but they decrease within two to three weeks. Um, and the overall in Delegate in Blackberry, we actually saw that with each successive application, we did see a slight increase in the residue levels, suggesting that it kind of compiled or builds up over time on those plants and on those fruit. This is our maximum modes of action, so we used all three materials that we could use with a one-day PHI here. We have Delegate, Malathion, and Mustang Max. And Delegate, Malathion, just like before, you get a peak of residue application, it decreases quickly within two to three weeks. Um, Mustang Max, we also saw, we saw blueberries where those residues will accumulate with each application. But in general, we, we are within the MRLs for this fruit aside from um, for the European Union. And then our last treatment was non, no organophosphates. So this was a rotation of Delegate and Mustang Max. Just like we had talked about previously with each successive application, 
you actually see a slight increase in the amount of residue detected. Um, and with delegate, just as before, you get a peak and then it decreases in two to three weeks. And then the same question, how long do residues persist in BlackBerry? Um, it's kind of variable. So within the same year, we had a difference in the amount of days things were detected post-application. And so this could have a lot of factors involved, including rainfall, how you apply it, how you prune. There's a lot of things we have to take into consideration. And in all reality, in BlackBerry, we harvest blackberries every two to three days. So if you look at the days after application, it's not feasible for most of these materials to get to a zero detectable residue. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to just conclude this by, by pointing out a few things about residue persistence. So the question we get about, is it being possible to reach a zero detectable residue? Maybe. It depends on what you're applying, it depends on the weather, and it depends on the system that you're working in. So blueberry, which isn't harvested quite as often as blackberry, you might be able to get there. Um, blackberry, it's, it's probably not gonna happen right now, maybe in the future. And as we showed you in those graphs, you do need to pay attention that some of those materials will persist for weeks after application. This also highlights the importance of rotating active ingredients. Ruth has touched on this already. Um, this is important for good resistance management. It helps to minimize your detectable residues with less buildup of the same material applied over and over. Um, but you should know this requires planning. So all these materials that persist for a longer period are probably going to be better to use earlier in your spray program than later. Save the shorter, shorter PHIs for later in the season when you have to pick frequently. I believe that's the end of my slide, so I'm going to turn this over to our next speaker. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, some of the tactics we're looking at to improve the efficacy of the insecticides we spray for spotting Drosophila, uh, particularly by increasing the uptake of these insecticides through the addition of phagus stimulants or feeding stimulants. And also how can we improve the efficacy for longer through the inclusion of spray adjuvants. So starting with the inclusion of phagos stimulants to increase the efficacy of insecticides, the theory or the premise behind the inclusion of these in phagos stimulants is highlighted in two studies. The first is research conducted in Tohoku University where they found that when Drosophila, similar to Spotwing Drosophila, landed on surfaces covered with something sweet, taste receptors in the fly's feet uh, led to the initiation of feeding automatically. Thus, this could be exploited to get spotwing Drosophila to ingest more insecticides by coating our fruit with an insecticide plus something sweet. The second study was by Richard Cowles and some members of this project, including Carlos Rodriguez, Sana, and uh, Greg Loeb. In lab bioassays, they found that exposing spotwing Drosophila to surfaces that had previously been treated with a solution incorporating sucrose and the insecticide spinosad, mortality in the flies increased when compared to just a spinosad only treatment. In addition to sugar and sucrose and sweet things, it's also been discovered that spotwing drosophila also have a strong affinity to yeasts and thus we also included that in our treatments for this year's work. So in 2016 we set out to test the use of these phagos stimulants in a field setting and work was conducted across a number of states and crops. These included work by ourselves here in Michigan, Frank Drummond's lab in Maine, Ash's lab in Georgia, all worked in blueberries. Gregory Lowe's lab worked in fall red raspberries in New York, and Nick Wyman and Vaughn Walton worked in cherry orchards in Hood River in Oregon. In blueberries, treatments included the insecticide Delegate at six ounces per acre, alone and in combination with sugar and yeast. These were applied at three grams per liter and 3.6 grams per liter respectively. Treatments were applied to small replicated plots over a three to four week period. And in one of those weeks, we conducted semi-field bioassays. For these, shoots with leaves and fruit were picked at intervals of zero, three, five, and seven days after spraying of treatments. And the ears were placed in bioassay containers. To these, five males and five females were added as seen in the picture here on the left. This experiment allowed us to observe the effects of residues of our treatments on mortality by counting the number of live flies at regular intervals after exposing them to the field collected material. The effects of the number of eggs and larvae produced by the females is assessed by salt testing the berries within those containers uh, after seven days of exposure. We would also include a, a piece of diet and a moist piece of dental wicking to ensure that there was no effects of 
starvation or desiccation on the mortality of the flies. Moving on to some results, uh, here's some data from raspberries on the top and blueberries on the bottom. The graphs displayed here compare the mean total infestation of the fruit from our semi-field bioassays. As you can see, infestation of raspberry fruit in the bioassay containers treated with delegate alone and in combination with phagostimulants all had lower infestation than the untreated fruit. However, there is no discernible benefit of the inclusion of the yeast and sugar. We can see similar results in the bottom graph on our work in blueberries, albeit the trend, a trend toward higher infestation, particularly in fruit from the delicate in combination with sugar treatment in five and seven days after treatment. In these experiments, we also assess the level of infestation in our treated plots in the field. Again, uh, we have data from raspberries on the top and blueberries on the bottom. The graphs displayed here compared the mean number of Drosophila larvae per fruit in the field. As you can see, uh, there was limited evidence of a reduction in infestation in the field. In raspberry plots, uh, the com at the completion of experiments, the lowest infestation was observed in plots treated with delegate, delegate and white sugar, and delegate with white sugar and yeast. In blueberry, the infestation, even in the control, was quite low earlier on parts in the earlier earlier parts of the experiments. However, the trends at the conclusion of the experiments, the lowest infestation was observed in plots treated with delicate and white sugar, delicate and yeast, and the delicate and white sugar and yeast. Some benefit was observed with our, our field infestation. So we'll move on now to some data generated in rabbit eye blueberries in Georgia. Here, here they applied a number of different insecticides, including Danitol, Xrel, and Imidan. All these would have been applied at max label rate, alone and in combination with our phagostimulants. And phagostimulants would have been at the same rates in the previous experiments. The graphs displayed here compared the mean mortality of adults in the semi-field bioassay containers. This is the effect of mortality of those residues on the adults included. Some interesting take-home points from this research. As you can see, XRL with sugar uh, had a higher mortality than just the XRL alone treatment. Uh, particularly at seven days after treatment. Benefits of increased mortality of the spotted wing drosophila were also seen with the inclusion of sugar and yeast with imidan after seven days after treatment. Looking at some data from sweet cherry uh, from Hood River in Oregon. Experiments here had three different insecticides. Mustang Max at a four ounce rate, Delegate at a six ounce rate, and XRL at 20.1 ounces per acre. Sugar alone was used as a phagostimulant here, and this was included at a 0.1% or a six ounce per acre rate. So similar to the experiments carried out in raspberry and blueberry, uh, here semi-field bioassays were carried out, uh, and this exposed flies to leaves and fruit with our treatment residues on them. In addition, uh, this was carried out all the way out to 28 days after treatment and mortality was assessed 24 hours after exposing the flies to these residues. So looking now at some of the data here from Cherry, uh, this graph displays the percentage mortality of adults in our semi-field bioassay containers. And as you can see, there was no real strong benefit for the inclusion of sugar uh, here one day after treatment. There's very similar trends between treatments with and without sucrose for all of our insecticides that were tested. Kind of ends it for our phagostimulant. So certainly there is an appeal uh, to using a phagostimulant or s something to improve the efficacy of insecticides. However, the evidence from the field this year does not show any strong benefits thus far. Uh, I can see some people raising concern in the Q&A box regarding these phagostimulants, particularly the sweeteners, and potential negative effects on pollinators or other beneficials. That certainly is a concern, and it's one that definitely warrants more studies. So we're going to touch now on some data from Gregory Loeb's lab in Cornell. They were looking at the effects of spray adjuvants on insecticide efficacy. So Greg and crew were working with Delegate uh, as an insecticide. They were looking at Newfilm P, this is a pinene based polymer, as their spray adjuvant. This work was conducted in fall red raspberries. As in previous work, they conducted semi field bioassays, and this was to assess the effects of our residues of our different treatments uh, on mortality of spotted wing drosophila. And to assess the effects of treatments in the field, they looked at the field infestation. So, on this first slide, you can see here that the results of the mortality assessments of flies, and this was 24 hours after exposure to the field collect material. And this field collected material were at different times after the spray treatment. You can see there was a bit of variation in mortality one day after treatment. However, 
the mortality of the flies exposed to the residues of delegate and new film P remained consistent and even increased uh, a little bit seven days after treatment, whereas uh, the flies exposed to the residues of just the delegate only treatment decreased over time. So this suggests that the nufilum helped extend the efficacy of the delegate, uh, particularly when compared to treatments where nufilum was not included. So looking at the levels of infestation in fruit in response to our treatments in the field. This graph here compares the mean number of Drosophila per fruit in the field. Here we can see some benefit from the addition of the spray adjuvant on the levels of infestation, particularly in the fruit treated with delegate and newfilm P. It's represented by the purple bars in this graph over the delegate only treatment, which is represented by the green bars. This is particularly most evident in the second and third week of the experiment, where the infestation levels were lower in those fruit treated with delicate and nufilum P. So this is just to give you an indication of one adjuvant. Obviously, there's other options uh, that uh, might afford the same or better effects, and more research really needs to be carried out in that. With that, I'll pass you over to our next speaker, Ash. Yeah, as we have learned so far from the uh, previous slides that uh, chemicals are primary means to control SWD in the field. And that is the case to prevent SWD, those female flies from ovipositing in the fruit and ca causing infestation, we have to maintain effective residues of insecticides on the fruit. There are multiple challenges in the field that might affect those residues and rainfall is one of those. And the question is uh, that Number one, does rainfall affect residues of insecticides after insecticides have been sprayed on the fruit? And number two is, how much of a rainfall does it need to be to cause it to lose efficacy or resi effective residues from the fruit surface? And also, can we do anything to minimize the impact of rainfall in other words, uh, even if rainfall happens, to prevent some of the residues from uh, getting washed off of the fruit. So in order to address these questions, we did studies to basically, in this case, we tried to simulate uh, rainfall. In order to rely and de uh, depend on natural rain rainfall, it was very hard in the field situations. You always get different levels of rainfall and it was very hard to plan study. So we used this center pivot system uh, to deliver different amount of rainfalls. There we used uh, three levels of rainfall, uh, half inch, an, an inch, and an inch and a half. And obviously we had a, a block of untreated control, which you can see here on the slide. And to see if we can do something to mitigate the impact of rainfall, we used a sticker NUFIM 17, and this study was done during 2014 field season. Zero on the slide you're seeing is no NUFIM, just the insecticide itself are control, and number one it indicates the use of uh, NUFIM 17 with the insecticide spray. During 2014, we tested uh, these chemicals you are seeing on the, uh, on the slide, Delegate and Trust, Axel, Malathion, and Mustang Max, Res after spraying insecticides, we collected uh, the residue samples one, three, five, seven, and 10 days after uh, treatments and conducted semi-field uh, bioassays, brought those samples back in the lab, released five males and five females in each of the bioassay chambers that we have seen in uh, previous slides, and then uh, looked at mortality one, three, and seven days after treatments. Our uh, 2014 results show that almost all of the insecticide residues were affected by the rainfall. When we look at the level of rainfall uh, that caused a significant decline, almost all insecticides had a significant decline after one inch of rainfall. With malathion, even half an inch of rainfall caused significant decline in residues of, uh, uh, of the residues on the fruit based on those bioassay results. So as you can see here, and during 24, I will not show you other slides, just to, uh, the other trends were exactly similar. And during 2014, this was the only one incidence where we did notice significant positive impact of 2 film 17 in Mustang Max. 
where after one inch of rainfall, it was able to maintain residues after one days after uh, treatment application. And as you can see here, with Maslin Max is one of the longer residual material. We do expect a, a good uh, mortality even after seven days, but we are not seeing at all in this case, which was due to the rainfall that we observed. And we repeated the same study in 2014 at a different site in, uh, in 2015. And during 2015, uh, based on manufacturer's uh, advice, we changed from new film 17 to new film P. And we did notice a significant uh, impact, a positive impact on delegate, as you can see on the slide, and, and trust, and also melatonin. The impact we did see in terms of uh, uh, protecting residues on the fruit of delegated and trust, it was at half an inch rainfall. And in case of melatonin, it was able to prolong residues even one inch after rainfall. To summarize, uh, rainfall does wash off uh, residues of almost all of insecticides. Now, every rainfall is different in terms of in intensity and uh, timing and uh, amount of rain, uh, rain that uh, uh, falls. So there's uh, no real way to simulate every single rainfall, but based on these uh, simulated uh, studies that we did, if you see any amount of rainfall, half, more than half an inch, you must go back and reapply to make sure that fruit is protected from SWD. With this, I will pass it on to our next presenter. All right, so I'm gonna move forward and talk about uh, whether application timing can improve insecticide efficacy. Um, so this is some work that was done by a graduate student in my laboratory, Katie Svoboda. She used a combination of passive traps, these malaise traps in between fields. There we go, these passive traps that are based in the, uh, between fields, as well as eastern sugar traps. She checked these traps on a regular basis for a 24 hour period to look at activity uh, for flies orienting toward traps. What she found was that flies, and then here we're showing you female flies captured in Eastern sugar monitoring traps during different times of the day. What she found is that more female flies are captured in the morning and evening than at any other time of day, either during the middle of the day or in the evening. She also found, and a number of other scientists have found, looking at spotted wing, that you capture more flies in between fields than you do within fields. We know that flies tend to spend most of their time on borders or in non-crop habitat, as opposed to in the middle of our fields, which we're actively managing and harvesting. So the next thing that Katie did was armed with that information about when flies were active, is she tried to determine if trap captures correspond to periods of infestation timing. So she caged fruit with fine mesh netting prior to it ripening. And then she went out during those same periods of time, removed those cages and allowed uh, fruit to be exposed to whatever fly activity was going on during different points during the day. And she found in the figure on the top of the screen in green that the proportion of infested berries vary based on time of day, again, with a higher proportion being infested in the morning and evening hours and that the number of larvae present per berry in purple on the bottom of the screen also followed follow that same pattern where the highest number of infestation events or the highest number of larvae present were occurring during the morning and evening hours. So what this means is that flies are active during dawn and dusk, and that is also when they are coming in and infesting fruit. And this has implications for how we think about managing these flies with with respect to insecticide timing. I'm gonna move on and hand this over to our uh, next presenter. Thank you. Yes, so bas basically when uh, management programs are based on uh, repeated applications of uh, insecticides, one question that uh, comes up the first, uh, as a first thing is, can SWD flies adapt to insecticides and develop resistance against those materials? to assess the impact of obviously a couple of years of applications since SWD came in, we went ahead and conducted uh, some of the, uh, to collect some field populations in Michigan, Georgia, and some of the other states uh, to determine 
whether field populations have evolved resistance against the chemicals that are being used. To assess the levels of resistance in field populations, we conducted residual uh, bioassays where we used these small scintillation vials. We coated them with the insecticide solution and released flies after the residues were dry inside and assessed mortality six hours after the uh, flies were released in the wilds. And based on our results so far, in, in Michigan, we tested several populations. And uh, on, on the slide here, you're seeing uh, the populations collected from no or low spray uh, orchards uh, or blocks. But the blue lines are showing uh, populations from organic orchards, and red lines are showing populations from conventional orchards. In almost each uh, and every case, you're seeing that mo mortality was close to 100% in case of Mustang Max, e even at one parts per million. When you compare that with the uh, rare field rates at 50 gallons per acre, which is 60 parts per million, it looks like that flies are, uh, have not developed any resistance, or at least we don't see any evidence in this case, and uh, chemicals are still as active as, as we want them to be. In case of malathion, same thing. At, almost uh, at uh, 10 parts per million, mortality was more than 90% in every single population tested in Michigan, where field rate uh, is uh, close to 3,000 parts per million. So even in this case of, of malathion, we are still very good, and these chemicals are showing high efficacy. In case of spinaturan, Again, we did see uh, high mortality, close to uh, more than 90% in lots of populations uh, at uh, 100 parts per million. And the field rate in this case is 225 parts per million. Again, we are maintaining or achieving 100% mortality in majority of the field collected populations below the field rate. In Georgia, again, really high mortality was observed close to 100%, less at less than two parts per million, whereas field rate is 60 parts per million. Malathion, same thing. We are getting very high mortality at very small rates, which are very, very low as compared to the field rate. In, in case of delegate, again, high mortalities are happening in the field at very low rate as compared to the field rates. So. The way we conducted biases is kind of complicated. We have to collect field populations and raise them to have enough numbers to treat them at five or six concentrations. On, on the West Coast uh, at Washington State, Bexibiers uh, developed this uh, way of screening field populations where they conducted the uh, same biases to develop a diagnostic dose, which would make the screening of field population process very easy, where they first developed those biases and then used it twice, LC99 means a concentration that would kill 99% of the population and used that dose to test just a small subsample of a field population to see how many of the flies survive. This is a good way to, uh, and a quick uh, way to assess whether there is a population, or there is a resistance in the population or not. And they, their bias is conducted in Washington and Oregon during 2014 and some of the 2016 bioassays show that none of the flies survive in most of the chemicals that were tested. In some cases, there was some survivorship, but it, it is very, very low. Uh, bottom line is that at this point, we have not seen any evidence of uh, uh, flies developing resistance to any of the chemicals that are commonly used, but still, other studies that we are not showing here do indicate the risk of resistance and potential of resistance in SWD flies. So always make sure to rotate chemicals from one application to the next and use different classes every time you go back to SWD. With this, I will pass it on to our next speaker, Hannah Brock. All right, thank you guys. So that concludes um, the data presentation from our webinar. I'm now going to summarize each of the sections briefly, just so we can remember what we've learned in the last 50 minutes or so. First, we talked about selecting materials effective for managing spotted wing drosophila. And as Rufus showed us, diamides, organophosphates, 
and pyrethroid insecticides, as well as phenocins, are among the most effective insecticide classes. And in all of the host crops where we deal with spotted green drosophila, we can build a rotational program that will result in effective control. As some folks pointed out in the chat box, however, if you are joining us internationally, there are some challenges with respect to the harvest intervals for these materials. Um, all of the materials that we include in our experiments have a three day or less pre harvest interval in the United States. That is not the case in some other countries, so please do keep that in mind. Next, we talked about programs to potentially reduce pesticide residues, and we found that when we use these materials in accordance with our US labels, we are not, as we would expect, exceeding maximum residue levels for US markets. However, European Union and Canadian MRLs may be exceeded for some of the materials that we worked with, and so that does limit possible marketability. Next, we looked at which insecticides were associated with lower residue levels. Formaldehyde, spinosin, or spinosin materials, specifically spinetaram and zeta cypermethrin. At some point in our experiments in North Carolina, those reached a zero detectable residue level in blueberries and blackberries, but all of the other materials we tested did not. Next, we talked about tactics to improve efficacy. We talked about phagostimulants and adjuvants. Do these improve our insecticide efficacy? Sugar and yeast provided limited benefit and not a consistent benefit, but new film appears to improve efficacy in crops. And again, as some of you have indicated in Q&A and in the chat box, we need to understand more about what the, that new film addition does for things like pesticide residues. And so that's on our radar screen. Next, does rainfall negatively impact insecticide efficacy? It does, and all of the effective materials are reduced by rainfall, but there are some ways that we can improve that. For example, the inclusion of adjuvants, one adjuvant in particular that we tested, and we're going to continue to look at other adjuvant options. Can application timing be used to improve insecticide efficacy? We now know that spotted wing drosophila is active on field borders in the morning and late evening. So targeted spraying at those periods of time when flies are active may potentially improve control. We also get an added benefit of timing our insecticide applications in the evening in particular, because that is a period of time when our beneficial insects, particularly our pollinators, are less active, and it allows the maximum amount of dry time between pesticide application and when those pollinating bees become active again. So an evening application has lots of benefits beyond potentially killing more flies on the wing. Finally, our spotted wing soft will becoming resistant to insecticides that we are currently using to control them. Screening in Michigan, Washington, Oregon, and Georgia to date indicates no resistance development. This is good news, but it does mean that we have to keep rotating our materials and we have to keep using them in accordance with their labels. We've added some uh, links to online resources that might be helpful for those of you attending this session. Um, first, we have a link to the global MRL or maximum residue database. Uh, that's where you can find information on what pesticide residues are allowable in which crops and in which countries. We also have some sites that have spotted wing drosophila information specific to the western part of the country, the north central part of the country, and the northeastern part of the country. Our project website is at swdmanagement.org. We will have this presentation posted here after the session. We will also be sending out links to the email list of folks who registered. Our project Facebook page is SWD Management. You can find us at that link. And then the spot, specific websites for the folks who presented here today, Ash down in Georgia, Griffiths and Philip in Michigan, and Lauren and I in North Carolina are listed. So we want to acknowledge our funding source. This project is supported by the Specialty Crops Research Initiative through USDA and NEPA, as well as a number of different local and regional funding agencies. And finally, we would like to ask for your assistance. So our last slide is a link to our Spotted Wing Drosophila Impact Survey. We would really like for you guys who are growers in particular to fill out this survey. This information is particularly important for this SCRI funded project because it's how we determine whether we are working on the right questions in the right crops. So please do fill out this information for us. It asks you about the impacts of SWD in the crops that you grow in the last growing season, and it should take you about 25 minutes to half an hour. Um, if you're interested in organic production, we did have some questions in the chat box about organic uh, production related questions. Next week, February 1st, 
there will be a organic spotted wing drosophila management webinar and you can get there through the link listed uh, on this slide. Um, so with that, uh, we are gonna go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Thank you so much for attending. I apologize if we couldn't get to all of your individual questions. Um, feel free to contact us after this session uh, for any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer and for any additional information. Thank you again, and uh, we will have more webinars in the future.